Today's lessons are basically a guide for being what Jesus wants us to be. God calls us to be salt and light. That direction didn't go down very well with the people Isaiah was talking to, and it's still a challenge. In today's lesson from Isaiah, the people complaining sound a lot like my three-year-old grandson. Look at me, Nana, he says. He wants me to notice him, and if he doesn't get attention for doing something right, he's happy to do something that will get him attention, whether it's right or not. Well, the people are complaining to God. Hey, God, we're fasting. Aren't we humble? Don't we look good? Why aren't you telling us what a great job we're doing? Well, God has a quick answer, and he's not being terribly gentle with them. I'm not telling you what a great job you're doing because you need to change directions, God says. This fasting you're doing, it's not exactly the kind I want to see. And then God outlines what a fast that will get them noticed by God should look like, to spell it out in the clear language of the message. This is the kind of fast day I'm after, to break the chains of injustice, to get rid of explo exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families. Do that, God says, and I will look at you. You'll shine like the sun. Your light will be so bright. Well, that's God's promise. If we keep the light and the fast God wants us to keep, we will be God's people the way we're supposed to be and we'll be healthy, strong, shining people. God tells us and Jesus tells his disciples, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Notice he doesn't say you will be salt and light but he's telling them and us that we're already salt and light just by following him. Salt and light, for those of us here, those are pretty common things. We take them for granted, but in first century Palestine, they were a lot more precious. We have all kinds of ways to keep our food from going bad, canning, refrigeration, freezing, and we have access to so many forms of salt that many of us need to curb salt in our diets. If I want a large box of sea salt, I can go down to the 99 cent store and buy one that weighs more than a pound. Back then, getting sea salt from the waters of the Dead Sea was a process that took weeks. Water from the sea was poured into pits to have the water evaporated off and leave behind the salt. It was hard work, it took time, and all of that made salt valuable and everybody needed salt. For people in the time of Jesus, salt was the best way to preserve meat, to add flavor. Salt was used as an ingredient in almost all the offerings in the temple, whether they were grain or animal or anything else, salt was added. It was used as a disinfectant. And one of the things I learned this week in the studying all this was, according to a passage in Ezekiel, Newborn babies were rubbed with salt. He compares the nation of Israel in his time to a newborn nobody wanted. He says, on the day Israel was born, nobody cut the cord, cleaned her up, rubbed salt on her body, or wrapped her in a blanket. Salt was important. It still is. If you somehow deprive yourself totally of salt, you're going to be very sick. And anybody who has been put on a low-salt or no-salt diet can attest to it. Most of us humans love and crave the taste of salt. We crave and we need light, too. And once again, we have a lot more access to light than people in the time of Jesus. I mean, look around us. We've got light unimaginable just in this room. Even the larger houses in those times had few doors and almost no windows. So most of life was lived outside, in a courtyard or on the roof, whenever possible, because that's where the light was. The oil lamps used in Jewish homes were small, about the size of a cereal bowl, and would hold enough oil maybe for the palm of your hand at, the, at one time. Uh, far cry from our lamps, our ceiling lights, flashlights, computer screens, phones. I've got a brighter flashlight app on my phone 
than I have any place else in my house, probably. The list goes on and on. Even a modern campsite would have more light than was available in Jesus' time. So Jesus calls us to be two precious things, salt and light. How do we do that? Well, the prophet Isaiah gives us that list of possible ways. Feed the hungry, clothe the ill-clad, work for justice for everybody, pay attention to people and care about how others are treated. What does that look like today? I went searching for all kinds of ways, what does that look like, and I didn't have to go very far. One of them that I found yesterday that was just a gift to me was an article in yesterday's Ventura County Star. Um, Ojai Valley Community Church recently sold their five-acre complex, buildings and all, to a local businessman for $1.5 million. They had been contemplating being a church without a building for a while, and things fell into place when Brian Johnson was looking for a place to earn, open a learning center for his online business at the same time they were advertising and praying for the right time to sell their building. It reminded me a lot of the Christian Church of the Hills that ended up giving us, selling us their building. Their pastor, Paul Bergman, said the last straw came for him personally when he was writing a $3,000 check for a plumbing bill just after the church had spent $500 to send someone to a sober living facility. As he said, it does not light my fire to be writing out checks six times larger for a plumbing leak than saving a person's life. Well, his congregation agreed. And most are looking forward to having services in parks, senior living centers, and the Ojai Arts Center. The interest alone from selling their building will keep most of the congregation's expenses paid. I am not advocating this for every church, and I am definitely not advocating it for New Hope. For us, having a building of our own allows us to be salt and light to more people. What does that look like for us? All we have to do for a few suggestions to that is pull out the bullet and insert. Being salt and light looks like the barrels out in the narthex, quickly filling up with cans of soup and other food. Voting for your favorite team for the Super Bowl by putting a can of soup or other can into one of those or the other is a way to share your food with the hungry. In a more involved way, being salt and light can mean being a board member for MANA, the food pantry where the soup is going. We have a person that does that. Or just using your vehicle to transport the soup cans over to MANA. We have people who do that. Being salt and light looks like signing up to provide a salad or bread, dessert or drinks for a community meal once a month with others at New Hope. Or it looks like Mary Lee and her team planning the meals, getting the entrees, and figuring out how many pans of lasagna they'll need to feed 50 to 70 folks and how many ovens it will take to bake those pans. It can look as simple as contributing $5 to help buy one of those pans of lasagna, or give up a Monday night to serve that pan and to talk to people as they go through the line or while they eat. Being the light of the world can mean praying for your family, your friends, and your enemies. It can mean having coffee with a neighbor and listening while they talk about the pain of a family member fighting cancer and then offering to pray with them sharing the love of Jesus, or asking if you can share their pain with the New Hope prayer chain. On the other end of things, it can mean stopping what you're doing once in a day to pray for a stranger when you get that prayer chain email from Gail. Being the salt of the earth looks like clothing the ill-clad. That can mean going through your dresser or closet or coat closet to find the things your family doesn't wear or has outgrown, or bought for that special occasion and now doesn't get used anymore. Taking it to Goodwill, the Salvation Army, or LSS for specific things they need. It can mean buying an extra package of socks at Costco to share with someone who probably only owns one pair at a time. It can mean providing LSS or MANA with other non-food things 
like diapers or personal care items that allow your neighbor to lead a better life, more dignified and more productive. Being the light of the world can mean doing little things or big things. It can be as small as letting a person go first at the stop sign with a smile and a wave, or thanking the person who serves you at Starbucks or waits on you at Target for their service. If your car has a Christian symbol on it or you wear a cross most of those times, do those little things so that people know what being a follower of Jesus looks like. It can be as big as taking hours of your time to get together with others of different faiths and plan huge events to support one another, like my friend Desta does, bringing together 70 faith leaders Thursday night at the Islamic Center of the Caneo Valley. It can be as big a gesture made by Pastor Steve and King of Glory Lutheran Church in Newbury Park, who let the par participants at the Islamic Center use their parking lot every Friday and who are offering that same parking lot this afternoon to the who knows how many people who will gather in support of our Muslim neighbors. Jesus says we're already salt and light because we are his followers. We bring a welcome taste to life by living his love. We share the light of his city on a hill by being kingdom people. He loves us and cares about us, and that love will never run out never fade away or be taken from us. And the most wonderful thing is that no matter how much of it we give away, being light and salt, we'll still have plenty. It's not a limited quantity. Salt that never loses flavor, light that never dims, in the love of Jesus that will never, ever quit on us. So stay salty, keep glowing, Keep being kingdom people. Amen.